do a roll call um, since we're being recorded. Um, Molly, do you want to start and then we can just go? Oh, I'm sorry. I had a mint at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chiquita can start. Chiquita Yagro. <laughs> Joe. Susie is the bearing. Marsha Martin. Tim Waters. Harold Dominguez. Jenny Martin. Molly O'Donnell. I'll staple in the back or not. Who's that? Tim. Tim. We're just going to say your name. Oh. Just say your name. Oh. Tim Ellis. Tim Ellis. Eric Wallace. Steve Wayne. Uh, everybody, yeah. yeah, I'm just mad. <laughs> 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 Jessica Erickson. Lonnie Jenkins. David Emerson. Michelle Wayne. Becky Doyle. Lily Eugene Ray. Dave Hornbacher. Joe Rodriguez. And then I'm going to jump in actually with the remaining group. So obviously, uh, Mayor, City Council members, you know, Joni and Molly, we've added three people into our housing team. And so I wanted to uh, have them introduce themselves in terms of where they come from and where they work, because um, they obviously are bringing in different backgrounds into the team. So we'll start here and go this way. I'm Deb Calise. Um, I'm the new housing investment manager. Prior to this, I was at Loveland Housing Authority managing occupancy for electric properties, subsidized housing programs. Um, Resyndications, renovations, all those things are part of that CDG in Loveland. Um, and yeah, probably human services and housing for the last 20 years altogether. So. I'm Kaylee Whaley. Um, I am the affordable housing uh, specialist. So, your inclusionary housing program and your affordable housing fund, thank you for seeing. Um, I come from uh, the Seattle, Washington area. Where I worked for the city of Kent, uh, implementing a rental housing inspection program. And prior to that, I was with the Tacoma Housing Authority doing uh, real estate development acquisition. And I'm Katie Pong, and I am the housing development specialist. So, working on um, all of the projects that you guys have dedicated to ARPA to. Um, and so, I came from, I'm originally from Michigan, but came from um, I've been in Montana in the last five and a half years um, at an affordable housing nonprofit uh, doing development work for them um, with Flytech, cap contracts, kind of the whole gamut of affordable housing funds. So excited to be here. Thank you. So actually, this is a really good group. Um, Katie's interesting because Katie doesn't come from the city side of the equation. She actually came from the private nonprofit side and working with the city. So she bringing all of them bring a different slice into the puzzle as we're continuing to move forward at different components. So um, obviously we requested that this be a work session with city council so we could um, have a conversation. Council gave us direction to create a task force. We could work with it um, during that time. What we were trying to do is actually we were actually working on a few things. Um, finishing on the closing of Christmas two and the, the reworking of all of those contracts. Um, a lot of work on the uh, housing authority side, getting uh, several projects lined up to go. Finish the resyndication on Aspen Meadows Senior Housing, and so at that time we were working on trying to bring this together. Um, as we started working and looking at what do we want to talk about in terms of with the task force, we started going. We really need better and more policy direction from council because. What we were really starting to see is that we could have brought any number of things back to you all and we wanted to understand at least where some sideboards existed so we didn't spend time on things that there wasn't going to be any interest of and us working on and really focused on what council was interested in. So that led to the question of can we do a work session? So this is actually designed for us to have an open flow conversation with each other. Um, I may push you at times to ask some questions and dig in a little bit into some depth on some of the issues, but we really need the policy guidance out of this so we can bring some things back that are tangible for you all. As we're working on this, one of the things we started with, and this is just um, something I want to thank uh, Erica for, for building this, but this is really kind of showing you what's happening in terms of land use. We anchored on 2002. 
So you can see 2002 come in, 95 come in, and then you can see 2014, and you can see kind of some, some land supply. This I wanted to show you all this for a couple of points. One, when you, when you, and we're going to ask some questions on this, but when you see this, what you see is actually there were areas in the community that were slated for development that um, are no longer able to be developed. And if you look at just to the left of the numbers, um, when it turns green, you can see that that's uh, open space that the county acquired. Uh, but you also see something similar occurring near Terry Lake and what that did. And so it really just shows you that when we talk about the growth in the community, it has been really pretty much set early on, but you can see we're actually we've had re reductions in, in land use in terms of what that looks like in the future. So this is just a loop. If you want to look at the individual slides, we can go in there. Um, Joni, I don't know if you have anything to add to this one. You know, I think it's a good representation of what's happened to our planning area over time, and I think that is both based on community values um, and council choices and around open space, which has been a very important community value for a long time. And um, those choices from the 21 years I've been here in planning, I know have not been made lightly by council, um, but they certainly, when we talk about land supply, and they do have some specific land supply numbers on our current um, comp plan, you know, those things change how much land is available in our planning area for future growth and development. And I know that um, we haven't spent a lot of time on this probably in the last five years, so just thought it would be kind of a good snapshot of remembering back in the day when the planning area went all the way to Terry Lake, which is pretty far north. Has subsequently been um, changed a lot, and there's a number of reasons for that that are just open space. There's a lot of difficult to develop parcels based on storm drainage issues, but again, thought it might be just worth showing you guys to kind of see that change over time. So, um, Council had envisioned long lots, so you all, um, some of the Council in this adopted in 2016. Um, at that time, City Council adopted some forward um, thinking coach or code changes in place or to support envision and housing for everyone in our community. In that, you really look at density height, mixed use corridors, and infill and things we put together. Um, obviously, this is something that we've been focusing on as a city in terms of when you kind of look at what's in play right now. And um, I will just say this as an employer. One of the things that we're looking at, which is what we brought to you all in terms of some of our positions where we had to move the hourly wage structure, we had to move the wage structure up because we knew that was an impediment too. Um, and then you also have cost of living. And so I think part of that is you can't look at the cost of housing without looking at wage structures either and what we have in place. And I know we're going to see some pretty significant changes within what we're going to have to pay our staff members based on our budget. It seems to imply that the income is falling, but that's not really true. It's just the pressure on it, and and sometimes the income's not keeping pace with the cost of housing either. So that's and present, a that's certainly true. Too. And so I know that we're looking at that in terms of our staffing positions, and and you'll see something that Molly put together in terms of where people fit based on what they make, in terms of what some of the numbers that we're looking at. And actually, this was the group that came in and really talked about is what is affordable housing. I think we often get caught in the trap of looking at affordable housing and and saying, well, it's really that area of housing that's below 80% AMI. And that's true, but that's really what it's related to in terms of state and federal funding and really the HUD piece. And that they typically, the funds that are available from the state and federal government are all for 80% AMI below. What we started seeing was there are people that make more than 80% AMI, but they also need housing as well. And so at the end of the day, what we kind of landed on last week is affordable housing is really about creating housing availability at every income level within your community, because that's what you have to work on. Um, and I think we, we lose sight of that at times. Somebody that's 82% AMI, 85% AMI, they can't afford housing either. And, and so it's how do you look at that component, bring that to bear. 
So Molly just um, looked at some of the numbers and I'm gonna have to do some switching based on the way the technology is working today. Um, so this is really the updated numbers in terms of AMI and housing. Uh, so here is that. I've got to go over here. Okay, so now we're showing this. And so, Molly, do you want to go over the spreadsheet? Sure. So what we're showing here is the uh, affordable in terms of income levels in the blue columns and then what we're calling attainable in the orange column. So uh, what we're showing is if you're using the updated 2022 household income numbers that HUD recently published and looking at our affordable and this is really geared towards for sale uh, sales prices. The breakdown is 51 to 60 percent AMI, 61 to 70 and 71 to 80. Um, that equates to the annual incomes that you see here. And we put in some sample occupations from some generally available information, city positions, UC Health positions, St. Brain Valley School District positions, just to, to um, illustrate what kind of folks are in these affordable ranges or in the household ranges. So our inclusionary housing ordinance sets a maximum sales price for affordable levels at um, using 33% of your household income. HUD likes to say that you should not spend more than 30% of your monthly household income on a housing payment. Um, this council approved up to 33% reflecting some of the, the real conditions on the ground here in this area. So what the, the current um, affordable maximum sales price is based on 2018 household incomes, but here's an updated number if we were to update it to 2022 incomes. So a maximum affordable sales price for a single family detached home using 33% of your income is $401,000. Um, I should say that this is a maximum. So some lenders allow more than that to be purchased, some less, but dependent on the amount of debt that you have, et cetera. So we have them also break, broken down for attached product as well. Once you move into the attainable range, we're using that same 33% of a household income, but we also added a 35% range to better reflect what we're hearing that you could uh, lenders could approve up to 40% of your household income. Not that HUD says you should do that um, to really be affordable afford the rest of life, but we've got those two numbers here to kind of show a range of what should be considered an attainable sales price for a single family detached and a townhome. Do you have a question? Yes. Why well, is it an across the board percentage? Because obviously, if I make $100,000 a year and I pay uh, a third uh, of that income on housing, I have a lot more left over for other stuff than a person who makes $50,000 a year and has to eat on two thirds of that. You know, it, it's not really a very effective measure. So it's really, it's used in the inclusionary housing code to mm -hmm. set a maximum sales price. For this demonstration, we're just kind of showing what that income level, sh what it shows across the whole spectrum. It's just for demonstration once you're past 80% AMI. Um, the, the last thing we wanted to show on here is for a single family detached home, the median sales price from January to April, 2022, so the most up to date, is 626,000. And so when you're looking at 33% of your income, that is showing that's falling somewhere in the 130% AMI range. But recall that that's the, the actual sales price. This is a, a maximum. And so it may or you know, it may not may or may not be exactly 130% AMI folks being able to afford that. Same when you're in the attached section at 445 is the median sales price in 2022. That is showing that a 100% AMI family can afford that. But again, these are assuming no debt, assuming the max possible approval rate. And so as a point, we are we are working on another project right now that is um, attainable in nature. Um, 
and associated with some property that we own. And in the meeting last week, our numbers were coming in fairly close. And when we look at this at 35% AMI and what the, the folks that we're talking about potentially partnering with, our numbers look pretty similar in terms of the, the 111 to 120% AMI. Yeah, and I, I don't think that that's quite the question. I mean, I know what HUD says, and I suspect also that uh, lenders are using this as a rule of thumb. And yet, a high income person spending 40% of their income on housing is not as good <coughs> as a low income person spending 40% of their housing. And, and it just seems like um, not just the city, but everybody from HUD on down should be acknowledging that. Yeah, I think it's interesting and, you know, I was having a conversation with some folks earlier and they, they were talking about how sometimes the more you make, the more you spend. And so. Yeah, but that's a personal choice. Right. But anyway, those things. But I think that's in this, too. And that's why we were showing you this breakdown of who tends to fall into these categories. And, you know, for example, what we would say in most of, and these are a lot of city categories. So we, we have some depth on this one in terms of what we know. Most of them are coming in. Most of them, a lot of them have debt that they're bringing in, whether it's student loan debt or other things, because we're having these very conversations with them as we're seeing some things. And so that's another piece to the puzzle. But this is just to kind of show you where the price points are to keep that in mind and what do we want to do. Um, the other thing, and I need to show you the other thing that we did. So got to stop this and share something else. <clears throat> so part of the next thing that you're going to see. Uh, so this is really a different slide that we're going to show you that's next in here. And this is actually something that we took from many of the um, projects that we're working on in terms of public private partnerships. And obviously this is a dumbed down version of a more detailed pro forma that we have in place in terms of as we're working with different partners and what comes in the cost. The reason why I wanted to show you this is because of a couple of things. We have reached out to um, some developers that have built some affordable projects. Uh, they've actually agreed to talk to us and they've agreed to share their pro formas with us. Um, they don't want to do that and, and I get it because it's proprietary in a public setting. So. We're actually going to engage with them, have some meetings, uh, and then create model port pro formas off, to, off of what they have um, so that we can have something to work with. But we've um, got those meetings set up um, and we were looking at it. But whether it's um, work that we're doing associated with Costco, whether it's some of the projects that we have in terms of Christmas 2 or whatever, there are different components that just come into the price of the housing. So, Obviously, you start with land, um, and depending on whether you own the land and you've had it for a while and you don't have, um, you know, if you've owned land here for 30 years, your basis is going to be much different than if somebody comes in and tries to buy it now. And so, obviously, we saw that in some of the um, projects that council voted on uh, with Costco. And if you look at the price that we paid for the nine acres of affordable housing, that was much different than what the market showing. Um, and I also said who controls it. This is where I'm trying to figure things out. So obviously land um, owner and market really kind of sets those prices. Um, we get into the land use processes and um, I would say there's two there's two groups that control this. It would be obviously the city via codes and fees um, and I'll say consultants too in terms of the quality of design, how they bring it in and what they send in. I mean, uh, Again, some of the prior groups that we have partnerships on and what we're doing, we've had to really come in and be pretty aggressive in terms of quality design that we were seeing and what people were trying to submit. Um, so we've seen that now on the development process side. Um, development prep cost. Again, you kind of see the city codes fees um, impacting that consultants. Then you get into a version of fees and securities. So you have permit fees, uh, storm drain. This is just an example, electric community investment fee, transportation community investment fee and securities. Then you get into 
the development construction costs, which is what we're really talking about, is the horizontal construction. And at the end of the, at the end of that, you could take the total cost coming in and total cost per home. So this is what we've done when we've built our performance on, on various projects. What we don't know is, depending on whether you're the developer that's doing the horizontal work and then selling to a builder, or if you're all in here is there's a piece where we're blind on this. And what we realize is we're blind because we don't know what the markups are when they sell from one person to the other. What we can say is the projects where we've had economic development agreements in, we actually see it as part of the financial agreements. And so we're able to move through as we're trying to solve different components. Chris Mintu is a prime example of this. So we had a one and a half million dollar hickey, but because we were all seeing everything clearly, and we knew it's open book deal. We all were able to come in and collectively solve for that issue versus um, just trying to hit points based on what we're seeing. Um, you get total cost, you get total cost per home. Then you go into the, and again, this is simplified. Home prep, everything it costs to build a house. Um, you take the total cost at that point, and then you can get a total cost per home if you know the density. And these are going to be important questions because this is going to get at some of the issues. We need to have some policy guidance. Again, blind to what the markup is. Um, the individuals that we're going to talk to said they would open book with us and show us what that looks like. But so it's secret to the state. We can build a model, yes. It's proprietary and we have to be work with Eugene to make sure that what we have. Because if they're willing to share with us proprietary information, we owe that because it's giving us a look at something that um, we normally wouldn't see. Very similar to what we did at other economic development projects. Uh, we, we owe what? Non disclosure. Yeah, non disclosure agreements. I can. And so um, you kind of get to that point, there's a markup, and then you get into lenders fees and real estate commissions. And then that's the total cost per home for an individual. I just wanted to highlight this because there's rows and rows and rows of information that, that's backing up this pro forma in terms of how we brought in landscape fees you know, the amount of stormwater work that we have to do. This is an overly simplified view of a pretty complicated pro forma that we use to do this. I hate to ask this, but I had a question about the previous slide mm -hmm. about the difference between a town home and a single family home because they were in the same attainable columns, but the town home costs less. And so, and I know why they cost, it costs less, but doesn't the attainability shift because it's a townhouse and so different people can afford it? it, it I just didn't understand the way the spreadsheet was organized. So when you look at the price points and, you, and we have historically had this difference, we actually had this conversation Friday is, at what, Sorry. <laughs> no, at what point do we stop? going, here's the affordable, here's the price for an attainable unit, here's what it is for duplexes, townhomes, and single family, because the reality is at a certain point, it's what does it cost to get an attainable house? And it should all be in this in, in this set um, of 400,000, because also, and you'll see some of our questions that will take you there, there are ways to have attainable products and literally we're in a meeting Friday on this, but you need the density, which is it is inclusive of single family detached, attached single family, both duplex and of uh, what do you would say is the um, sort of condo style. Sure, it, you're answering a different question than mm -hmm. I meant to ask. And I realize I didn't do a very good job of asking the question. But you've got a column that's all about what a person at a certain income level can attain, uh, whether it's affordable or right. not. They can attain the same size mortgage, whether it's town home Correct. or a single family home, but you've got a more expensive single family home than, than the town home, and that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, part of that is the ancillary costs. That are included. Ah, because you have to pay a condo fee with for a townhouse. I can see yeah. that for you. Yeah, the methodology that I used for it is for single family, I used 80% AMI. Yeah. And then for 
the town home, I used a 70% AMR as the base because the assumptions HUD makes is that somebody who is going to be seeking a town home, which will be less expensive, would make slightly less. So for, for the sake of this discussion, that's how I kind of did it, just to give it a picture of someone who is seeking out a town home would okay. make slightly less. And the fee and the fees associated with sure, the yeah, they the, the higher, higher fees are higher. They're not yeah, the purchase price, but they're higher. higher. Yeah, and HUD typically looks at that max AMI, that max percentage of your income that you pay towards housing should include all of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I'm fine with that. I just yeah. without knowing yeah. the assumptions. Yeah. It, yeah, that's the assumption. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And this is just that we're going to come back to you all with a more detailed look at this. It was really just showing you here's what the numbers are now and what we're seeing. So you, you go out of that spreadsheet and you go, what are the cost drivers and what can the city directly impact? So we can't impact land costs, construction, lending policies, insurance, quality of designs. We can't impact those. We can't impact time, development requirements, land use and land use processes, code design standards, fees, taxes, and securities. That's what we can as the city. So then we start, I started thinking about this and going, so how did I look at some of these projects that we are either participating in, considering in the future that we're going to build? And so it really is this um, matrix. And so whether it's um, benefit at the bottom, low to high, whether I'm looking at certainty, risk, or cost, low to high, a lot of times I put the variables in this. And so what I'm trying to figure out mentally is what I want is high certainty um, because now it depends on what it is. So you can have high certainty and high benefit. You can have high certainty and low benefit because of the way the questions are answered. For example, and these are questions I'm going to ask you all a little bit. Do you want growth? Do you want density? Do you want height? The reality is, is if you say no, no, and no, then you've created high certainty in that you don't want it, but it's very low benefit because you're not going to have the space to build what you need to to hit the housing goals. You go, yes, 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 that tends to be high certainty, but potentially high benefit. So I use this to think through it. And um, We've got a slide that we can use as we're going to work through some questions for you all as we move forward to where we can plot this real time based on how you're seeing it. Here's a question for you to think about. And this question actually came out of some of the conversations on an attainable housing project that we're working on. Don't want you to answer it now, but I want you to think about it for the future is if you create more options to facilitate attainable and affordable housing. Should we approach this via a development agreement that is open book? I don't know what that means. So think about um, our economic development agreements. So when we came in, I'll use the Costco project since that's public. We had an economic development agreement that was really a contractually outlined document that said, here's what you're going to do. Here's what the developers are going to do. Here's what the city's going to do. We outlined all of our responsibilities and it was completely open book where we knew what the costs were as we were moving through it. And so as things hit, we structured it with, OK, we can pick up X amount if you have cost overruns and do this. Just a question of do we want to look at it from that perspective? Before you go any further. Back slide. <clears throat> that matrix go forward to those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, my response would be to that. Well, it all depends on what our goal is. Right. Mm -hmm. Until you can tell me what we're trying to accomplish, I would change the matrix based on if, we, if I knew what the goal was. I change that matrix to risk and certainty as the axes. Right. And if the goal was to achieve a certain outcome in terms of uh, units. And I, if I'm a developer in this room, I'd like high certainty if I'm going to assume risk and then identify the policy options in that in that quadrant that I can count on from the city. And, that, and that's actually where I'm just saying as we go through this, I'm sitting here going, 
It all depends on, on what the goal is, what we're trying to accomplish. Right, because the, the attributes that you listed, like do you want density, do you want height, those are attributes. They are not goals. Our goals are uh, equity, economic growth. Those are goals. Um, but it does, you know, if we if we can achieve that through density, which is, you know, height is a way to achieve density and other stuff is a way to achieve density too. But but it's it seems like we're graphing the wrong things, which is the same thing as Tim just said. You need to know what the top level objectives are. And you know, I mean, I think it's economic growth and equity at the same time at a minimum. But I don't know what everybody else thinks. Well, and, and that's kind of leading to this question. And this is this is a hard one to answer, and I know it is. But if you said generally, what percentage of homes do you want be do you want to be attainable as we're adding homes every year? We've got to start somewhere. And, and, and the challenge is, if you remember when we were looking at the map and the land use, the reality that we have to face is how much land do we actually have available for the development of housing? Um, and Joni has something on that one, don't you, Joni? Or? Yeah, so we have about overall in our planning area, not just residential, we have about a little over 12% of vacant ground planning. Mm -hmm. On the total planning, you're 12 percent is undeveloped. Yeah, right. and there was a new statistic right. that just came out re recently, and I can't remember the reference, but it was 5 percent actually within the existing city limits of uh, developable land in Longmont and the highest on the front range, and I'll find it some, if somebody challenges me on it. So, so to uh, both Marcia and Tim's point when we say what is the goal, I want to go back to how large of a city are we capable of handling resource wise, et cetera. And what I have heard is it would be 120,000 to 130,000 people. Um, ever since I lived in Longmont, that's what I've heard. We're at 100,000. So re going into this percentage wise, how many units do we need before we reach our maximum when we say we cannot build anymore because of resources, water, land, um, whatever else is in that mix? And before, for me, that's the first goal we have to decide upon. And how do we get there and still keep the community that we have? So are we going to look at what our growth is and during what time period or does the time period make any difference that's really important to me when we look at everybody's looking at water and uh all, all the other resources so so it's interesting where's becky what did we have on the population for water like 130 and, and uh or maybe David in the water study, 130,000 ish, give or take. I think part of that changes though, too, because as you look at a more dense product and you look at uh, condos and you look at townhomes, you don't necessarily have the yard. Granted, what do we know from our data and work that Becky did? Your water usage in homes is actually dictated primarily by the number of people. Around. But if you don't have the yards, you do lose a portion of that based on the, the style of development and how many people that are there. And we also know that our usage per capita has been going down consistently. So I think it looks a little bit different in terms of the product that you're dealing. You know, a dense product with less yard and others uses less water. So I think it's understanding the product okay. that we're going in with. Okay. Just as the is on the water board, the water board put the challenge before the staff to put together a bunch of scenarios going up to about 200,000 people. And what would it take? Because if you go to an urban planner and mid the water constraint, we have enough land for 200,000 people, depending on how we build. Mm -hmm. And we have enough energy potential so really the constraint is water 
and the I public just, will. Yeah. I just wanted to put that out yeah. there that, that we need to look at everything as we're doing this. It's not just. Uh, and, and also, we have to be do, looking at traffic and transportation at exactly the same time as we build density with less parking. So I don't, I personally don't want people to just think we'll just build a house on these people, but but how do we manage the city once we're doing this? And and I think that's really important. So, so when we had up to the Division Long Line in 2016, it was estimated we were going to grow by another 24,000 people in that time horizon of Division Long Mont. Um, I believe the units added number was 9,000, but is what we were looking at to add to house that population growth. And again, that's our horizon of the comp plan. So I think there are some data points that we could certainly look and do some projections to bring back some data um, on. Um, yeah, what if we change the parameters? If you think about the city currently, if you look at just residential areas in the city, I think that the density is about 6.8 units per acre. If you looked at all the land in the LPA, it's closer to, it's under two units per acre. So we're not very dense, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the nature of suburban growing community in the Colorado Front Range. So I think shifting how we look at infill and redevelopment and density I think like Roosevelt Park Apartments is something like 60 units to the acre. So the context in which we also talk about density needs to be helped out with some visual aids of what that can look like and what living options we might have. But that's kind of the snapshot from Envision Mayor. Okay. But I do think we could do some extrapolation. And I know Molly and Aaron had put out an RFP with our dollar grant to get the data. Unfortunately, since we got no takers on that, we're going to try to revise that and see how we might get some help. But in the meantime, we've got, you know, some pretty good technical expertise in planning that I think we can do some of that data work. Envision on uh, when it was adopted, uh, was it wasn't the forecast. Uh, at, at, at the density that was incorporated in the right, 116,000 by sounds, the end of the planning period. That sounds about right, because right. if, yeah. if we just are at 99,600 now, we're going to add 24. Yeah, we, yeah, was it 9,000 units to get to 116,000? Yes, right. so, so the ratio, I, I could calculate it if I had a moment here. If, if given what we've already done with some, some options in terms of greater density and what we might want to do, the number of 130,000 is what we keep hearing, right? In terms of water uh, reserves, of water portfolio, et cetera. So just quickly, do the math, well, I do the math, right? Sure. <laughs> if if, if 9,000 units uh, house 116,000 people, how many more units to get to 130, right? Right. And then I'm going to talk about what I think the percentage of that, those new housing, I've asked this question, right? Of the housing units to be constructed to build out to 130, just assuming we might want to argue that's the wrong number. We ought to have that argument or that discussion, but at least we have an idea. It's this many more units to 130, and we ought to, and with equity and you know the concerns. I, I'm not undervaluing, but for me, it's like I got to start with what's the top line. I agree. With right? You. Is it is it another 9,000 units? It's not another 9,000 units. Another 4,000 units on top of the 9,000, whatever that is. Then we can talk about how many of those need to be attainable and then talk about the policy options and increase the likelihood that we're going to see that. Now we can start marking progress and what tweaks we have to make along the way. Just, I don't think it's rocket science, but we have to start with some pretty good numbers here in terms of what we want to see as build up. And how serious are we about housing people in attainable homes? Exactly. I agree with that. Could you get the number? So just to make sure which number we're calculating. Um, he wants to know yeah. how, many, how many housing units to get to 130,000. If we got 9,000 to get to 116, mm -hmm. what, how many more to get to 130? It's approximately doubled because that's 9,000 for 17,000 from 99 to 116 plus another 16 ish. I think 9,000 is for 24,000. I got 52.50. 52.50. More. Thank you, Beth. I should have asked that. So, of 5,250 homes, what percentage of those should we do whatever it takes to increase the likelihood that we're going to see those in the attainable range? 
right? Right. Or part attainable and affordable, whatever that mix is getting. Because part of what, I mean, and this is an open-ended question intentionally, because I want to see what commitment and where do we want to be. What is it that you all want to see? So, um, I agree that if we had 130,000 as a maximum, that that would be what we would do. But I don't agree with the idea that the number should be arbitrary or even that the number should be necessarily constrained by the water supply because we have goals that what we really have is, is a, a multivariate analysis, at least a linear program, because what we need to know is how, how much recruiting do we need to do of knowledge workers in order to keep the economy going, how many people in order to keep our economy equitable do we need to be to to enable to move from Greeley to Longmont where their job is so that they aren't being double charged on how much it costs them to live. And so what we really need to do is start with, all right, this is the proportions of Longmont's employment economy now. What housing capability do we need to have to make that an equitable self-contained city and we know that we need to solve for the size we need to be to be balanced before we even start. Well, I think discussion. that's what this is all about. Just these percentages. So I feel like we're starting in advance of that. So there's work that we've got to do to bring this back to you, but it really is a frame setting in terms of of the remaining houses. Do you want to go big and say 50% of those should be attainable? Do you want to go? But to Molly's point, so you've got 9,000, what you say, 5,200, is that what mm -hmm. Becky came up with? In addition to get to 130, so so you got 14,2 that we need. Of the 14,2, what percentage do we, I mean, you, we know of that number, 12% is affordable. Well, that's an arbitrary number, too. I remember saying it wasn't enough in 2018. But... So the question for you all is, of 14,000 homes that we could build, we think we could build, mm -hmm. what percentage do you want to be attainable? So what is 12% of all those homes we can build to start off with, whether we, whether we stick with that or not? Do we happen to know the population that are under 80% AMI right now within the city of Longwood? That's the work that we couldn't. I don't know. We we have some census, but not anything really. Fourteen. So I hate to keep harping on it, but we don't know that it's fourteen thousand homes because we don't know. That, you know that, for example, does not include the assumption that we're going to allow people who are our frontline workers to move closer to the city. Well, that's a different. But we should. But we must. But but that's kind of a different. You know, when we talk, Carol, about um, a percentage of the homes or the units being built have to go to people working within the city per their uh, W-2 form. So that's that's kind of really different. Well, so and you also have some limiting factors. So right now, some limiting factors are land supply, mm -hmm. height. And that's density. not a limiting factor. But right now there's a limiting factor mm -hmm. to that that says you can only go one additional floor over if you have um, the affordable housing. So there are factors yeah, but, that and, limit the number but of units. over a, a code that's present. And, you know, we've had conversations about, well, depending on how, how um, high the land is, you really ought to be able to allow more stories as used by right. And honestly, I think if it backs up to Weld County, you ought to be able to have a skyscraper. So that's just me. It seems to me that there's enough complexity that we've got some challenges here. To add levels of complexity, which is I think I want to hear, not that that's not important considerations. I'd rather, I'd rather set some numbers and then talk about the predictable outcomes, some intended, anticipate what the unintended outcomes might be in terms of equity issues or whatever. We could spend the rest of our lives trying to figure out some of it, how to socially engineer this without ever coming to a number in terms of what it's going to take 
to get more attainable houses in Longmont. Well, I can't agree with that because we're going to have to, it's going to cost us a lot of money to restructure the city from a suburb to an urban design now. I don't want to have to do that again in 10 years. I'd like to have a long-term plan for where we're going. Well, I, I would as well. I guess the question is how you get how you get there, and how many how many variables or how many layers of complexity you want to try and factor in on the front end of this. So I'm going to okay. I'm going to come back to this yeah. one. Okay. Go ahead. I know I. You know, to put all this in perspective, I don't know how we can get to these percentages until we decide where we want the growth to be and uh, how high. Um, but do we want the growth? That's what they're asking. Mm -hmm. Do we want the growth? And, you know, uh -huh. so there we go. Right. So, yeah. So what I was doing is trying to in, in stimulate the conversation because I think the, the first, so to the point that was just made, the first quest, the first three questions for me, um, does affordable and attainable housing take precedence over other topics slash policy items? I mean, and my questions to you all to help us frame this out as we bring something more tangible back, is council willing to support affordable and attainable housing within the framework of our land use plan, knowing that we will grow as a community? Are you willing to adjust the land use designations going forward to ensure that we have the densities necessary to to support this type of housing stock? Are we willing to support height to ensure that we have the densities necessary? And then the question is, is where? I mean, exactly. and I, and, but I think globally, I need council to answer those questions because to me, the answers to those questions will tell us pretty quick whether or not we're going to make a dent in this or, or not. So should we go around and have everybody answer the first one so that we're not <laughs> and then take them bullet point by bullet point and everybody gets a chance to have their opinion. Okay. So um, if you have more questions after this, I'll I've got a lot of questions for you. Oh, okay. so okay. This is a point where I need to. It's but and they are they build on each other. So I, I would say we can have this general question answered. It would help as we move forward. For me, can you go over number number two a little bit more for me? Uh, is council willing to adjust land use designations? What is what exactly does that look like? What do you mean adjust land use designations? So, so when you heard Joni say that right now our densities are like at what two? What was it? Residential, existing residential. Per acre, mm -hmm. we're saying when we need to look at it for density and some some things we're seeing, it's 20, 40 per acre. Okay. So Shakita, do you want to start off at answering the first bullet point so we can just go around and help Carol out? Sure. I'll read it. Is council willing to support this type of housing within the time within the framework of our land use? plan knowing that it will grow our community and um, I'm willing to support it. Great. Me too, but when you say knowing that it will grow our community, that was my first uh, comment about how big are, are we and can we grow our community. So I will say yes, knowing right now that 130,000 is the is long and that can always be looked at as we go along, but right now per uh what Polly told us about how much it has grown at those level. So I I say yes to number one. I, I think currently what's happening is we're not growing fast enough. So all it's doing is creating a greater equity gap between the haves and the have nots and causing the people who cannot afford to live in the community they work in, having to drive from further, cheaper areas, which in turn, you know, it, it depletes their, their quality of life. I mean, I say it all the time with our teachers. So, yes. Right, absolutely. And I would like to add, um, 
as as the sibling of teachers, many siblings. Mm -hmm. It's not only hard on the teachers, it's hard on the students. Mm -hmm. Your teacher should be at worst across town. And um, so, yes, in fact, I'd give you my answer to all three of them. But yes, on this one, I think that we need to at least be flexible in our, in, in, in our scenarios and not set an upper limit to growth until we know more about what the parameters are. So yes. So I'm actually going to grab something. So what I heard Mayor Peck say is something similar and that we could revisit the upper limits over time, yes. but we need to understand it. So you're kind of saying yes, but let's not artificially set it until we understand it. So it's, mm -hmm. it's like kind of the same thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not worth arguing over tonight. Right. Okay. Yes. All three. Okay, Shakita, number two. <laughs> um. Well, I, I mean, I'm all for it because we are growing and we will grow. So um, I'm looking forward to the growth. I do want to make sure that we are responsible with the growth. Um, so that means that we will have to adjust the land use, even if we have to look at different options. Even what about land trust you were talking about on one of the other slides about um, making sure that um, land is, is something that we is very impactful. And so we have to maybe look at some other possibilities like land trust. Um, willing to support the hike? Absolutely, um, for sure. Back to um, Councillor uh, Hidalgo Faring, what she was saying, the, the gap in equities. We are, I, I appreciate the city putting this together, but we should have been doing this a long time ago. Um, but here we are, and I think that we need to to make sure we do it responsibly and um, because it's inevitable, we are growing. And so let's make sure that we um, be able to revisit and uh, but we need to get on it. Yes, and I want to make a comment that I should have made at the beginning is that Mayor Pro Tem, Aaron Rodriguez couldn't be here because of a personal matter. So I'm too bad because I love his comments. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Okay. So I'm hearing everyone say yes to all three of yeah. those. Yeah. With uh, it depends on where. It depends on where. Yes. 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 Yeah, it, on it, it depends on where and in number two, because I thought we were going around one at a time. I'm sorry, I broke the. Everyone, oh, everyone, 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 everyone. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but, oh, but on number two, what we need to do is not just look at. Land use, like the last time around, we made the street facing lot narrower. Okay, and that that was that was a good first step, but it was in the single family home paradigm. Yeah, but, yeah. And so, what we need to look at is not just lots and height, you know, but we need to look at patterns. Like, you know, if you go to um, uh, Blue Vista Thistle. Mm -hmm or I'm sorry, Thistle's Blue Vista. Um, it's one of the most beautiful neighborhoods in the city. Nobody owns any land and the commons are very carefully laid out so that everybody has the ability to take a forest bath right in their own neighborhood. And we need to be sure that our um, development standards kind of include that kind of patterning so that we don't suck the soul out of the city and end up with housing developments. We don't want that. Um, and yes, I am absolutely willing to support any kind of height in certain places, but not downtown. On the on the periphery where we aren't messing up anybody's views. No one like downtown? Oh, well, we can have the height we have now, but we have two historic neighborhoods flanking it. I don't want to go through that fuss that we went through in 2018 about, um, you know, height variances and buffer zones and everything else. I mean, we're gonna say we have a historic downtown. You know, we want to be like Paris. Paris has a historic downtown. And there's no skyscrapers there. And if you get up on a on a church tower and you look around the edge, the skyscrapers are on the edge. But they have huge roundabouts. 
I think we want to be like Longmont. I don't want to be like Paris. I think we need to figure out what we want as a city and what our community. I don't mean we want to be like Paris. I mean we want to be like Paris in that we want to put our height on the periphery. So, Councillor Waters, you agree with all three as well? Yeah, I would. Uh, at some point in time, um, giving definition of what responsible means is going to be helpful. To that's a word that may have different meaning in every for every person in the room. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'd, I'd prefer to do is clarify uh, when we use that kind of language what that means, mm -hmm. because responsible growth may mean something quite different to me mm -hmm. than it does to you. Well, um, do you want me to respond sure, to that? Yeah. Sure. Responsible growth to me means not just making decisions without understanding the effects of it. That's what responsible means. So like. Making sure if we say that 130,000 uh, is the maximum, how are we being responsible with making the, the correct decisions for that 130,000 maximum? Um, because what comes with that 130,000 maximum of population? Um, are they over the 80% AMI or are they under the eight? Uh, what's the percentage of those of that population that? It, with that increase are under the 80%, so that means that's that affordability. How many of those residents can afford the housing with that growth? What comes with it? Do, do we have enough shops? Do we have a, enough amenities in this city to provide? We were talking about the library district. I mean, there's so much to think about, so we have to be careful with the growth and be responsible in our decision-making that comes with that 130,000. That's what I was talking about when I was talking about patterns, because if you don't, if you if you just do division without looking at where the amenities lie and how to incorporate them into uh, walkable neighborhoods, for example, um, then you're not being responsible with your land use. And my belief is that by setting a, a maximum, you're not being responsible with land use either because we have to be able to figure out we're trying to balance this land that we have into a functional city that is attractive to everyone and will stay that way for a long time, like a balanced aquarium. And if we, if it takes more than 14,000 more units to balance the city, then we better figure out how to fit them in without destroying our quality of life. Well, I think that's part of what we're trying to do right now is um, keep you up though around 30,000 feet because I think those are questions that are so granular that it's right. hard to say. Right. And that's and that's honestly where policy opponents will start competing against each other and it's a different question because that's sort of rooted in this at the end of the day of uh, you know, the example I will give you is so the uh, affordable housing that we that was built on Mountain View and Pace. So that was done with um, flood recovery funds and tax credits. And um, we went through the process. I think there's 14 units. It's four units per floor. Three floors at that time. You didn't have the exception for a fourth floor. So the developer went into that project had one neighborhood meeting. So that I'm out. This is going to be a question that we're going to ask later. He goes, I'm out because I don't want to have to go through the variance process in order to get another floor. So they ended up holding with the three floors that's in that project. And so when you do the math, we lost about 50 ish affordable housing units because of the process and lack of certainty. And so we see that routine. We own that just because of what folks have to battle with. But You've answered the first questions now. Oh, okay, but, but, you know, could, could, it just as I listen to your response to my question about what you mean by responsible, I'm sitting here thinking about a decision the council made very recently um, that wouldn't fit your criteria for responsible, in my opinion. And we made it. I did. I voted against it. Five was a five to one vote. We, we voted to increase the cost of water, right? the fee and lieu for water uh, that went in effect the day after that vote. It increased the cost of resident, any residential development that would occur on land to be developed for residential purposes um, with, with, with no options, no consideration except 
by a vote on a Tuesday night, we increase the cost of housing. Now, we could have said, don't implement that until we have an ordinance that allows us to make exceptions for proposals for attainable housing. I was trying to make that point that night. But we went ahead and the council went ahead and made a decision. For me, if we're gonna if we're gonna use that language, we ought to we ought to hold ourselves accountable for the decisions we make. And that Tuesday night, we made a decision that by your criteria is irresponsible, in my opinion. And I think we ought to we ought to be candid about that and make certain as we go forward, would we take the time to reflect on what the implications are, right? And it, sometimes it's going to take more than five minutes in a discussion to do that. No, I was willing to vote yes on the promise of the ordinance. I also think that it is reckless to not go through the complex analysis um, that I was talking about without, but, and, and, and set policy first. I think we, we need to understand that that a, a, a new urban city is a complicated thing with a lot of moving parts and we better understand them first. Well, and, and to be clear, you're, you're setting sideboards tonight that we know what to bring back. This is not a policy because we're going to have to be bringing more details back to you based on the answer of these questions. Fair enough. Yeah. But we we all said yes to all. Yeah, you've said all mm -hmm. yes to three. So you've got all the moving parts you need. Oh, I got well, more there's questions. No okay. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> I got more. Uh, we talked about the cost of land. We actually saw what we were able to do with the Costco project in terms of buying the nine acres of land in, in that deal. Um, does council want to consider a fund to purchase assistant purchasing land for attainable housing to lower the cost? And so similar to what we did with our affordable housing fund where we're putting in a million dollars a year in general fund dollars, this is something that council wants to consider for the attainable housing component of this. Let's go around again then. Everybody has a chance to give their opinion. I will, go ahead. I was I will consider um of course with all the information that I would need to review and look at. Um will council consider a fund to purchase assist in purchasing land for attainable housing to lower costs? Of course I would consider that. Yep. So what I with uh along with your idea uh herald of the open book that if we're going to be assisting development by providing land or a, a, a percentage of the purchase of the land for a developer, then it has to be total transparency with that developer, no hidden costs. So would that look like, um, I think I'm, I'm going to say yes, but I'm just curious you know, what it looks like in, in reality. Is that us purchasing land and then leasing it to a developer 400 years? Four or five bucks a year, or something like that. It could be that, or it could be just entering the public-private partnership, and you split the cost for you. You say we're putting the land, but at no cost to the homeowner, and so you could do that in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. similar to what you see in affordable housing when we're buying the land to, to build those units. Mm -hmm. So we maybe at the next level of analysis would would look at some possible patterns versus having a, a free for all. Correct. Second point to this question is, um, are you, is there any interest in combining it with the affordable housing fund and putting some parameter in where you can say no more than 30% of the affordable housing fund can be used on attainable just because your seed money in it's going to be there before you take time. And there's not a right or wrong answer to this. This is just, are you open to some combination with the affordable housing fund? For me, that sounds like, um, I don't I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. I don't know what that looks like. So I would have to see a demonstration of what that would look like. Just looking at that question, I would probably say no. I don't know if I would want to consider that, but um, I would need to, I would need to see an example. I agree with Shakita. Mm -hmm. Makes me nervous because yeah. I don't know what the 
federal sources of funding are going to think about blurring. You know, they've set some pretty hard lines, uh, and and they uh, affect our ability to get Litex and all that hoo ha. And so, if if there's any risk to our ability to get federal funding for affordable, then I would rather set up two separate funds. We we I mean, and that actually calls into question our existing ICO because it has the incentive for attainable in it. That's my idea. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So finally, yeah. this last piece. Are you open? Did, to, did, oh, did you weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I, honestly, I'd be inclined to say yes, with the understanding that uh, what I wouldn't want to do I mean, back up to do this. It, it would seem to me there may be opportunities mm -hmm. to to move on a project. To, to, to create housing stock that would be attainable, that we would be able potentially to do that we wouldn't otherwise be able to pursue Correct. without the fund. And I would I would much rather, uh, if, some, if you said, well, we can wait and get affordable housing in a decade from now, or however long that's gonna take, or we could get some attainable housing out here in the next 24 months or 36 months, I, I'd be inclined to, to move more aggressively to get the kind of housing stock we know we need because we know we're going to need both attainable and affordable. That said, I want, I want some guardrails to make certain we weren't de so depleting your affordable right. housing. Plan. So what I'm hearing from you all is, yes, for me. Yeah, probably not, but it depends on what the project is. Mm -hmm. Yes, conditional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it, it's, it's really understanding the regulatory distinctions because I, if, you know, if we have, if we have two funds and we say they're two funds, but we, fund them in a, in a ratio, for example, I don't understand the difference. They're all local funds. So when you look at our affordable housing and our attainable, those are local funds. They're not mixed with the federal funds. That so we don't have to worry account, about so it. All right, then and this, yes. This feels a little bit to me, that question, a little bit like um, the, the, the decision making process or the implications of what we did with credits for developers or builders giving us more than 12%, right? The tension around that discussion was concerns about what does the developer do with credits? It's like, what do I care? If we get 8% more or 10% more housing today or in the next two years that we'd have to wait for for 10 years. And let them do whatever they want to with the credits and, and, and do whatever we need, we need to do to get the housing stock now. And this feels a little bit like that potential decision-making, you know, kind of inflection. It's similar, yeah. I mean, it's like, project comes around and all of a sudden, let's say you can build 400 units. We don't have the money nor the time to come to build the attainable housing fund, but we can utilize money that's existing in the fund to do that. Yeah. It's really sort of about leveraging that and then how do you pay it back? Yeah. Similar to kind of what we did on the, the loan structure on. So here's the last piece and cities are starting to do this. Are you open to creating a fund, a private, businesses can invest in to secure attainable housing for their employees. And that could be through a uh, local nonprofit. Um, I know we're seeing that the mountain communities are doing versions of this um, and they get units. So they're investing in units for their staff. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I am open, um, I am open to that. Uh, private businesses. They're part of the community. And I think for those who care enough for their employees to want to invest and secure that, absolutely, for sure. I agree. I'd rather see public banking, but <laughs> <laughs> so yes. No, I, I feel like this is a creative approach. I'm wanting to see, see creative approaches that we haven't utilized in the past. <laughs> what cities are doing? Do you have any off the top of your head? Bill and um, some of the mountain communities with the hospital groups are doing it. Okay. So, so, yes, because there are two groups primarily that benefit from this, the primary employers and the employees of the primary employers. So, of course. Is this, is this a fund that we would have to create? I mean, but this is a fund that they, they, they can do it. LEDP could do it and manage it, and they could invest as we have. Yeah, I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's a billion ways to do this. So, yeah. what, why is that a question for us? Would you want to 
in creating that and partner with it where if the private fund brings in money and we bring in money. So we would be we would we contribute, contribute to the fund, not necessarily or they would contribute to our fund. So for example, when we had the chance to buy nine acres of property at a really good rate, yeah. what if I could have bought 20 acres of property? Or then you know the interplay between that. So who creates the fund is as important as the concept of a public private partnership. Correct. Right. Yeah, I'm down with that. So here's a question just listening to you discuss this when you're talking about a um, attainable housing fund could that be paired with this type of invest investment so that we yeah. are adding to it as well as businesses are mm -hmm. and it could be maybe um, can you bring that back when you yeah yeah we can okay. bring it these are just general questions that are going to guide some of the things we're going to bring okay mm -hmm. Cost of fees for development. Okay. Yeah, I know. So here's what's so basically today, and we may have to have another work session on this. Yes. And that's fine. Um, cost of fees for development. So today, if you're in a house that's over 80 percent in the spectrum of 80 percent AMI, basically you pay full fees um, in in the cost of development if you're in a house that's below 80% AMI, we have a 50% reduction that comes in on the affordable. You can get up to 100% reduction with council approval. The fees include impact fees, legislative fees. Impact fees are a little bit different because we have state statutes that regulate how much and why, or how much and how you can do this. We've got some legal work to do. But the big piece in, and I take you back to the first statement earlier where I said, what's affordable housing? And so basically, if you're in a house that's 150% AMI, depending on the fee, you're either paying the same fee or some of them are based on square footage, but essentially you're in the same fee structure. So the question is, is council willing to consider a reduction in fees for homes built in the attainable housing categories from 80 to 120 percent AMI? This takes a little longer thought process. Yeah. <laughs> Understanding that to the point of transparency, this could raise other rates and fees that exist too. So while they're thinking about it, um, you and I had a conversation about this a while back. And I remember saying, can the city afford to reduce these fees? Yep. And, yeah. Yeah. No, and, and I believe at the time you said no. It so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that would be my question because, of course, you know, and my other question is where are the fee reductions? Because I would like to apply some fee reductions, maybe not as big as you're suggesting, but some fee reductions to people adding ADUs. Um, you know, people switching from, as, as we've already done in one little narrow case, people putting a duplex where a single family home used to, used to be. Um, you know, so the applicability of this, these fee reductions needs to be um, more than just new development. Yeah, and I'm looking holistically at fees just in any of this. Okay, well, yeah. So, yeah, definitely as much as we can afford, we ought to, we ought to make the fees in. Yeah, I mean, I would need to know a little, you know, for me, I would need to know a little bit more about what fees that are, that could potentially be raised by the um, and the charges, you know, since I'm accused of not being responsible, only me. But I want to make sure, still, no matter what, I'm not sure. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know for me, myself. I will have to know a little bit more. So let me reframe the question for you all. If we can bring back fee reductions that make sense and can be supported financially within the structure, would you all want to see those? I would like to see those. Yeah, I'd like to see them. To know what we're actually talking about. Uh -huh. To drill down. Okay. Are you? Yeah, yeah. And also what fees and rates that will can that make the raise too. Yeah. So 
Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Just so we all have a chance. To yeah, no, I, I thought you were had gone around to me already. Um, so here's my question as I talked to you about several times. Um, is that each development has its own specific uh, development rates, fees, depending on what they want to do. So it's really hard for me to look at an, an umbrella type an overall fee reduction or whatever. And the developer is in essence hiring our staff to help them through this process. A lot of that, those dollars to pay come from these rates, fees, charges, et cetera. It's part of our income. Um, I don't mind reducing them. But I think what, what Councillor Martin had said about a year ago is that if there is a development that has been in the queue for over a year, we need to see individually what is the problem with this? Why isn't it moving forward? Is it us? Is it our staff? Is it, our, is it the developer? Is it federal or state regulations? What is the problem? And because it's really hard to address an issue if you don't know what it is. So um, I wouldn't mind saying that I wouldn't that I would consider a reduction in fees if it wasn't. I'm going to forget this. I've forgotten the term, though, but it's basically that we allow you and the staff to decide. What is that term? Administrative. Yes, administrative decision or review. Um, <clears throat> I'm not against reducing them. It's just that I know that every development is so different. Okay. So administrative review on it. I would also like to see too, like what are some of the policies we have internally that as council we need to look at again that maybe is um, causing the process exactly. to to go to expand too long. Um, you know, I've heard you know just a lot of mixed messages, but a lot of it's coming from policy that's been set by various councils with different priorities. So what can we do to streamline that process? I'd also like to see, you know, I have no problem with reducing the fees, but I'd also like to see, you know, if we um, reduce, you know, this particular fee, what is going to be the impact um, somewhere else along the line? But yeah, I'd be open to, okay. to looking at that. So one of the seminal results about um, quantif quantitative urban density is the understanding that the city's cost of maintaining infrastructure is lower when it's dense than it is when it's sparse. So, you know, the most expensive water and sewer on the planet are serving the Rainbow Ridge neighborhood. And we should be considering that in our fee reductions. So we can, we, we theoretically can afford more fee reductions for dense development than we can for sparse development. So maybe that should be included in the formula rather than simply the cost of the unit. Okay. So we skipped him. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out of your line of sight. Oh, I you did. You know, basically, what what you're asking is what we did really with the with the payment in lieu, the fee in lieu, right? For the, the, the affordable housing payment in lieu doesn't apply to attainable housing, right? Eighty percent, right. no fee, and then it's scaled, mm -hmm. right, from one hundred to one hundred twenty. I mean, I, that would be what you're talking about. Would be totally consistent with what we've already done, right, mm -hmm. in terms of fee structure. So what everybody else has said is looking at the the implications of that, and then. If you were to apply the same kind of criteria, and then you know where do you make up revenue? Right. You know, I and I'm and I'm where Marcia is. Um, you know, I've seen the same uh, you know, ULI work and on the cost of 50-year cost of infrastructure, right. which is like Rainbow Ridge, or you know, the, the, when we annex at the outskirts of town, that's why we've asked for a 50-year, not a 30-year analysis of what the cost of, of maintaining maintaining that infrastructure is going to be. And, and I'm going to ask that question when that proposal comes back with the annexation north of 66 and 99 homes, or if it comes back during my term on council. Um, so seeing some 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 variations or some options here, I think is a good thing. Okay. Part of this on the other side is re-looking re at the 50% baseline. So if you tear it, we may have to take that 50% for affordable and 
push it to 75% just to give us some room on the afford. Because what we don't want to do is you don't want to disincentivize affordable by yeah. over incentivizing yeah. the yeah. 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 So you've got to balance those two components as well. Can, can we anticipate as well? Can, let's assume we move forward with yeah. some for some fashion. Uh, part of the pushback is likely to be well, now development no longer pays its own way. That's going to be the that, yeah. that'll be the narrative that goes along with this. Right. But I think it goes back to what's the definition of affordable because what we're saying right now is and th there's a lack of attainable housing mm -hmm. and attainable housing in many ways is affordable housing mm -hmm. for those that just don't meet this number that the federal government put forward and it's still folks that don't make it i mean you saw the, the positions that were in this chart yeah i mean it's I, a different world i'm just saying there with the with the no growth or little you know whatever the the narrative is about stop growth mm -hmm. not, not in this room i mean but in the community um, you know, part of the rationale for that, or part of the response is, well, wait a minute, growth pays its own way. And this would be, we would, we ought to anticipate, in this case it doesn't, but here are the reasons why. By design, by design. We don't intend for this kind of growth to pay its own way. We're going to make that up in other places. I don't think it's true that it doesn't pay its own way necessarily. I mean, you can discount it, but but if if you're building something really dense and the fees are less, it might, they might still pay their own way. I think it depends. We've got to run the numbers, but I mean, but at the end of the day, if you're reducing the fees, it's not paying for itself. Uh -uh. I mean, that there is truth to that. Right? And, and, and holistic. My point is just to get ready for the politics of it. That's yeah. And that's why we're asking you all these questions, because mm -hmm. we're going to bring some stuff to you all that you're going to have to to look at. But, you know, it's embedded in the individual developments of what you're looking at. Well, but Carol, say, uh, it's a sewer connection. Mm -hmm. Cost the same one sewer connection, unless it's actually physically bigger, they all cost the same, right? The fee okay. is the same. Yes. Okay. So, but if if we have a denser area, then we get more fees per acre. So the city gets more revenue, essentially for the same big sewer line, you know, that they're all connected to. Not necessarily because what? you have, because it's by unit. So if you look at like a park fee, that's by door, Becky, correct? And so whether it's um, an 80% door or 120%, it, whether you're at a 160% unit or an 80% unit, the fees by door, and so the reality is, is if you reduced it, you would lower that amount on that piece structure. There are some by so square footage. what I said was true for sewers, but not for doors. Not even sewers. Maybe it depends on the design. I'm looking. Yeah. Sewers, sewers are funny one because it's multifamily. Yeah. It does um, decrease as Mm -hmm. But that's how we're in recent density, right? Multifamily. <laughs> but, but currently, the fee does that. Yeah. Units you have the, the less it is per unit. Oh, yeah. So, yes, kind of good. <laughs> that one's recognized. Right. Construction securities. I'm just gonna. This is one I'm gonna kind of try to move through pretty fast. We've been uh, evaluating this. Uh, basically, securities are there in place to ensure that work gets built um, and that construction's finished. What we've looked at is. You know, a couple of times, I think we've had to threaten to call securities a few times. We're not sure whether we actually did call them once or twice. I think we did. So we're trying to work through that, but it's not something that's really rampant that we have to deal with. Um, but what we were seeing is that this is something that adds uh, a fair amount of cost to a project. So when securities were originally created, you paid like 20 to 30 percent of what you needed to secure, and then you Basically, they gave you a letter of credit and you were good. And projects that we've worked on, and um, you all voted on things related to the Christmas project where this was in play, essentially now a letter of credit, you have to collateral, you have to have provide the collateral for the full amount on the securities. So it's a pretty significant cost. Um, what we're also seeing is that a lot of jurisdictions don't require securities for projects that are 100% affordable. But at the end of the day, we've really been evaluating this, and we think that 
we can adjust how we look at construction securities for both affordable and attainable housing. But we also think it may actually work for all our housing stock in the community. Um, and what we realize it probably save us a lot of work as staff if we can do this. And so really the question to you all on council is, are you willing for us to re-examine a changing our security process um, so that it I think makes more sense? We, we obviously will not compromise our system, but there's ways that we think we can approach it that will really allow us to maximize how we charge securities and, and how we bring them to bear. I, I have a question to come as an example of how would this work if we changed it. I just remember that the uh, development on Francis behind Mountain View Elementary School had like three developers. It, the first developer, I don't know, they were out of town, didn't understand their land, they come across it, and, mm -hmm. and they went bankrupt or left or whatever. It didn't finish the development, and another one came in, same type of issues. Isn't that what we collect securities for? Not for the construction of the units, it's more for the infrastructure that's associated with it. So the water, the wastewater, the streets, the landscaping, and those pieces. Okay. And so, yes, and what we're finding is that every project shows itself, it has a little different perspective. And you can look at them in different ways in terms of how you bring securities on, when you bring securities on. But I go to the question, are you, are you, does council, is council willing for us to look at this and change how we look at this process? I personally would say I would leave it up to administrative review. Okay. I'd say yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so yes, but I don't know how they work now because I don't. That's what we have to make a decision about. Yeah, well, obviously we're going to bring it back again. High level questions, and we knew this was a lot for you all. Um. And then, so when you go back, you know, you bring this back to us, um, would you give us some examples of what that looks like so we are really yeah, careful yeah. with exactly. our decision making process? Um, this council is council um, willing to consider allowing middle tier housing and more zoning classifications? So what I mean by that is in a single family residential, are you all willing to consider duplexes, quadplexes, townhomes in mm -hmm. single family neighborhoods? It depends on the density for me. Yeah. I sorry, man. Not density, but height. Okay. And so the middle tier is more it's not just, it's not the apartments, it's more the townhomes. Duplexes. So middle tier, think of attainable 80 to 120 percent mm -hmm. AMI, and those can be single story. They can be two story. Um, but it's not like six stories. No. Or you think it's like so that's why the yeah. height. I don't think. Yeah. So are you thinking about the missing middle? Kind of. Yeah. Like, I visual. Because <laughs> that's I'm what I'm visual. Yeah. That's what I'm envisioning. A, yeah. A, a yeah. development that's got different kinds of housing stock, but uh, very you know. It's architecturally, you know, pleasing, et cetera. Yes. Which we don't like, have yeah, much in love. Yeah, we don't. So I would say, yes, absolutely. There should be no single family zoning that is absolute ever again. But when we have um, architectural protections on neighborhoods for other reasons, like the historic areas that, um, you have to still be aligned with everything else, which is really what's happened now with the brownstones, right? It's it's completely compatible with the historic West Side, but it's dense. And uh, so, so yes. Okay. What about reducing lot size? So right now, lot size you know, 50 foot is really the current standard. You can reduce it to 40 feet if you uh, have the affordable component. And really what we're starting to see a lot of cities do is actually look at much smaller lot sizes. So what ends up happening is 40 may become the larger lot size mm -hmm. and you may go down to 25 feet where that's actually the realistic lot size. And so um, I'm trying to- And that aligns with 
you know, climate, we're looking at reducing our water, um, you know, that there's so many benefits to having, and I, I'm visualizing um, like the patio homes, so in a single family. With that, yeah. yeah, let me show you, let me show you what I'm looking at right now. So this is something that is for sale in Longmont right now. You can kind of see the land use in terms of the single family house. Um, I think so. This is, it's kind of what you're seeing in other communities where you're talking about reducing that lot size. And um, this is another really good example of what we're talking about and so a lot of times what you see in this type of development and i learned this from some of the folks that we're talking to is really where the wealth sits in a house and, and the wealth a lot of times is in the front of the garage and things like this they move that so it's rear entry garages but these are real developments i think these are both in austin where they've come in and they actually have million dollar houses adjacent to the homes that are attainable in terms of this development project where they really looked at reducing lot size. What it means for us is, is, is really, this is what we're talking about reducing lot size. You can see that it doesn't aesthetically, it looks great. And actually, um, I, I know for that. Yeah. I'd go a step further and say I would like to get rid of lawns, turf. It's expensive for developers and let people decide what they want to do with their. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, and that's the thing, that's areas where I think we also have to bring our landscape code exactly. in, mm -hmm. into alignment also yeah. with our sustainability goals, right. which gets, I mean, because there's some tension there now that we have to look at. Great. Uh, I'm going to keep moving you through this so we can get some of these answered. I know we have the housing authority next. Um, do we want to consider modifying our infrastructure requirements? This is a pretty significant question. And so if you look at how we're developing today, the best way that I can describe this is that, and Joni, if you disagree, you can jump in. But, she and I have talked about this, is our code right now is very suburban in nature in terms of wide streets, large areas in terms of easements and things like that. So when you look at some of the pictures that I just showed you about some of these other developments in that density, that's really more of what I call, this is Harold's term, an urban-based code. And, and so for me is, are we willing to look at a more urban-based approach which is in Envision and all the documents that we have so that we can look at creating more density in terms of creating more of those attainable units. But it is going to challenge us in terms of things like setback, um, setbacks and, and on our utility easements, maybe compressing them a lot more. Um, so, Joni? Yeah, no, this is what staff has brought forward in many iterations of comp planning. It's what we've seen in many of our PUDs across the community where we have some higher densities. Um, I think this is the standard of urban planning in most of America, and I think that it would be a good move to for council to be able to consider how they could provide some certainty for the development community as they look at different um, development standards. We've been asking for some design standard updates for some time, and I think that is something that really needs um, time and attention so that we could be successful. So, go around and get your key. What do you think? Yeah, I um, definitely wouldn't mind considering uh, modifying the requirements. I wouldn't mind modifying, but I want a staff report from uh, the Laying them on like I have heard that it's really hard to service them when they are in such a tight enclosure, water lines, electrical lines, etc. So I, I would want to hear what staff come back with us. 
come back to us when you bring this back. Yeah, mm -hmm. I will tell you that, is it hard? Yes. Is it impossible? No. And the ones that I'm going to want to hear from are actually our operational crews that are going to be doing the work. Exactly. And I think they've even found different ways to do this. So, so we would really like, like to hear that. Yeah, okay. yeah. I would mm -hmm. like to hear that. Yeah, I think Quail Ridge is a PUD that I live in that's almost there. We probably have data if we kept it um, about how much work it is to service rinks in there. Um, so, yeah, I think we have to. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see any question about it other than when we start buying the smaller tools. <laughs> Shorter fire trucks. Small well, people to get in there. <laughs> it's not only that. I mean, that's where we're going to have to bring staff and have a lot of conversations. But yes. I think the way we look at certain things like fire is very suburban based versus mm -hmm. we were in a meeting the other day and I made the comment. I'm like, well, you know, New York doesn't limit the heights of their building because of the ladder trucks. I mean, they use things like stand pipes and other development tools to deal with these issues. And I think we have to look at that as we're looking at a more urban based design. And, and when you look at some of these other neighborhoods, the thing that they do really cool is they bring alleys into play. And so yes. coming from a city where we had a lot of alleys, you can actually utilize the front of the street and the alley both as loading your fire equipment so you don't necessarily have to have the wits that you have in a yeah. normal situation. Yeah. So those are things we have to talk about. It's going to be a challenge. But. It, is, it is going to be a challenge. Is when we narrow the street size, when I look at just mm -hmm. on my street, how many people have the SUVs, that totally shrinks the, the mm -hmm. size of the road you can move on. So, you know, that's why I say we need to okay. look at traffic at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, ADUs, this isn't, you know, don't kill me, but I wanted to to let you all know this, is that ADUs are continuing, I know Council's decided and given us some direction on some of these, but we're continuing to see other communities really look at ADUs and doing some different things. So I'm just going to tell you about this. this. These are things you all can look at in the future, but things like ADUs um, becoming a form of ownership through condo conversions. So you actually have an owner that's in an ADU. Um, some cities are allowing two ADUs on every lot. Some cities are removing the ADU occupancy requirement. The reason why I brought this up for you all is because I didn't want you to say, hey, you didn't bring the ADU stuff up, so I wanted you to see it. Obviously, this is a different conversation and you've engaged in it, so this is more something. We'll come back around when we have more time for okay. you all to think about it. So we're not doing any marks on this one today. If you want to, we're just now 10 minutes over. So. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I think that that some of the negative stuff that was done around ADUs was in the interest of protecting a few neighborhoods that either have not enough parking to go around, which is a big problem in our historic neighborhoods because they were, you know, written for horses and designed for horse and buggy days, um, and not for ADUs in general. You know, there is no way that ADUs are not a huge boon for Southmore Park. Not, you know, a huge boon, no matter which way you look at it. So I would be for all of these things. Okay. Just keep the protected neighborhoods protected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's time to answer the question from earlier. So there are so many things that are potentially in play based on what you all have said yes to. But it, it's a significant contribution from the city. And so my question is, is, if we bring all of these things to bear, do you want us to bring something to you all that really looks like an economic development agreement or a development agreement for how to really capture this um, as we're looking at all these incentives? I would like to, but I would like to have another work session on it because mm -hmm. the council just isn't enough time to really discuss this stuff. So we can have another one. We've got enough to work on. Okay. okay. So. I'd like. When, when might we have another work session? What do you all want to have another one? Soon. We need housing soon. Um, I would like to mull over in the meantime, as soon as you can come up with it. 
an under, a better understanding of what a development agreement is because mm -hmm. I have no clue. With whom? Yeah. Yeah. What we can do is let's, let's make an economic development agreement and then just sort of put it in play. Um, actually, someone that we're talking to on a project parcel that we own has used those. That individual actually told us he would rather have that just certainty. because it's security and certainty. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, I'll see what he has and what he can do, and then I'll send that out to everyone. Great. Can we go to the journey? I would like to be Jimmy. Are you done, Harold? Can I ask one more question? Of course. Um, uh, now, six months ago, um, on a motion, uh, you gave, we gave you direction to form a task force. There is no task force yet. Yeah. I understand answering these questions will inform, I guess, what a task force does. But the question is, why do we need a task force? That's actually for you all, I think. It is to go over some of these things, but what we were looking at is we needed some policy direction to give them. We can take these <laughs> and go to the task force and then come to council. Well, or we can come straight to council with some of these answers. I mean, do you think you have the expertise? I mean, the goal was of the task force was to really get the stakeholders, the people with the experience to provide the input and recommendations. So I think the hard, Joni, you helped me on this. The hard piece. The hard piece is the people that you need digging in. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why the developers said they were willing to talk to us as staff, but not necessarily have the broader conversation mm -hmm. because of the proprietary issue. So I think mm -hmm. it depends on what we're talking about. There may okay. be areas where we're not going to see, and we may have blind spots where you do need it. There may be areas that are pretty straightforward, like fee reductions, security reductions, that we can move on now. Mm -hmm. And I think we can start bringing those forward. So I think it's a hard question. I mean, there may be some areas, Joni. I mean, do you think there's benefit in the collective impact model that we yeah. do with advanced on 2.0, right? And so you have, I think, many groups from Top Prosper City, and I think they've been working hard at some of these. So I think one iteration of a study session might be hearing from their lending group. I know they've been yeah. working mm -hmm. hard on the yeah. um, issues. So I think yeah. if we could look at that roster and talk to that group too, that we're not asking people to do things over and over again. Right. They're, They're already working, working on it. So how can we incorporate it? So um, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being a high level, right? How much smarter will we be? How much quicker will we be? If you appoint a task force to get us to to the as close to the right answers on these policy questions, mm -hmm. then it just feels like we've been six months. We haven't had this conversation in six months. We could have had it six months ago. We haven't. There's no task force. If I'm a member of Prosper, as it's a member of city council, I'm sitting there wondering: Is why would we not want to sit, put a date on the calendar? Get Prosper members of Prosper long month. Let's do it next Saturday morning. Or not next Saturday, but you know, and get at this as opposed to another bureaucratic process that will be six months from now to hear from a task force, and we don't have policy decisions. But yeah, I'm looking at you, but I'm speaking yeah, to us. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was something that wasn't directed. Like, that's directed yeah. to us. I, it but, just feels like we're treading water when we don't need to. First, but is some of the feedback I got when I asked certain stakeholders to come mm -hmm. forward and they felt like they were going to end up spending a lot of time spinning wheels, getting them you know, right. participating in a process, but not understanding what the outcomes were. I can certainly understand why so, yeah, they might think. You know, that was their handed yeah. feedback, not that they weren't willing to perhaps lean in at some point, but they really wanted to know, you know what could they lean into, what would be specific, yep. what would be most. So, yeah. So uh, uh, this is a city rules question. So can we, um, we've talked about several things that we put out, yeah. yeah, that we've put out to bid, um, and got no bidders. We've got LHA next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we see. Right. So yeah. So we need a. Yeah. So the question is, having had no bids through our standard procurement process. Is there a way that we could go out and recruit individuals directly and twist their arms and say, we want you to do this. We want you to find all the inconsistencies in our city code and simplify it. We want you to, uh, I forgot what the other ones that we talked about earlier. Um, but isn't that what we're doing right now? 
No, we're not hiring anybody right no, now. No, 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 not hiring. Is that not what we're doing at looking at the inconsistencies in our code for attainable and affordable housing? Oh, this is inconsistent. This is unmade policy. I don't think it's well, inconsistencies the in the code. I mean, we either have to use a planner to do it or we have to hire somebody. Yeah, I mean, maybe. So the question is, is what do these groups have in terms of staffing? Um, mm -hmm. This is not uncommon right now in this world to see people not submit uh, bids. It's happening all over the place mm -hmm. right now. So the answer is mm -hmm. maybe in our process, we can do direct, direct negotiations if we've had no better, but Valerie needs to add that. There's a technical. We did, we did reach out to those that opened up and then did not submit on this for the housing needs assessment. Mm -hmm. um, we talked to them and yeah, find out why. And most of them, it was a time constraint because everybody's doing housing needs assessments. So we mm -hmm. said, what would make you bid? They said time. So we're about to re-release it and we've given some extra time to prepare the submittal and then also or prepare the proposal and then prepare the product too. So we'll be a little bit behind where we thought we would start in time, but we thought the quality would be worth that. And since we have some policy stuff to do in the meantime, if those running those two in parallel is not terrible damage. No, and honestly, you've given me some policy questions as we're looking at other agreements that actually mm -hmm. have the potential to bring significant amounts of attainable housing in play. I'm going to use that as policy guidance in terms of how we look at these other projects. So. so, are we finished with this? Are there any more questions? Do we need to put together? Yeah, I'm good. I'm just here. Right here. Yeah, we're here. Yeah, I'm going to move to adjourn. Okay, second. Who wants to adjourn? Yeah, okay. Anyway, folks. Yeah. Okay. 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 So. Well, we're going to find some great. I brought a bunch of experts. Yeah, and allow them to. Um, so this is the. Can I buy? Can I get a chair? There's a lot of. Supply chain is costing materials. Supply chain is costing materials. Supply chain is costing materials. Supply chain is costing